All right, this is Terry Joyce. It's pre-show to uh, Freedom of Joyce on Revolution Radio. Right now, I am filming James Wright. Uh, he's uh, my guest today, and uh, we're going to start the show out here pretty soon. Um, here's the chat room. It's all going. Uh, so I'm listening to the show that's happening right here. I'm going to turn the camera over to Seamus, who is going to be filming the show. So, um, okay, and I'm going to put, like, a, a little note in here in the chat. Maybe like uh, I'll, I'll I'll bring this like a little bit more in the center here, and uh, kind of do it like that. And then James has his camera too. If you want to go on this side of me, okay. Um, I actually like put it out there before I finish typing and I hate it when I do that. And you know what? I have my mouse does this weird thing, so sometimes I have to have like a shirt or something to like a mouse condom? Yeah, I mean I probably should get like a, a like a different it's always been like that and I've just always kinda like dealt with it. And um so right, um um, well, actually, I photograph better on the left side of my face than my profanity, but it doesn't matter. No, whichever you want. Oh, no, this is fine. So here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we're cool. Yeah. So. Just being vain. This part isn't all that exciting. <laughs> <laughs> what, two people staring at their laptop? <laughs> <laughs> this is like some weird fetish porn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Type, type. <laughs> <laughs> if only it would be that easy. <laughs> How do you get hired for that one? <laughs> all I do is type. <laughs> I figured out a way to get hired for drinking, so I'm sure there's some way I'm doing to do it. With it. You, by the way. <laughs> That's right. 
we should talk about that. <laughs> like, to jobs that, what did I do with my glasses? Oh, okay. Jobs that are just awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Getting hired to drink. Our Getting hired to drink. <laughs> what we're doing on Saturday. <laughs> I do that uh, Wednesday through Sunday at right. night. Right. <laughs> Drinks included. Drinks and be perverted. <laughs> it's a guy. And who gets caught holding back? Hi, Kitty. You and I All right, Hi, there we Kitty. go. The show's getting over. Okay, I'm going to add Studio A, and then I'm going to mute my mic. Like, Lori, make sure you're, you know, really, well, she knows. You know the drill. Okay, so we're going to add the studio. All right, got it. Here we go. This is exciting. All right. Add people to this call. All right. Why is not adding right? Why is it doing that? Lori, I'm going to hang up. Okay, baby. Okay. I don't know why it was doing that. Four play. Five South Seas. 25 years from the freezer. Long term storm will fit four different varieties. So if the prices go crazy, the tickets, the fan, or you just want to say, tons of money every year. <laughs> Here we go. to the uh, Freedom of Joy show on Revolution Radio, and uh, today's a little bit of a different day. Uh, I'm actually, uh, well, I always usually use stream, uh, uh, you know, live uh, during the show at the same time uh, while I'm broadcasting on the, on the, on the radio, uh, just because I like to have extra footage and Sometimes I, you know, take my monologue and, you know, if it's good, I'll, you know, clip it and just, you know, have the monologue stand by itself. And, and uh, you know, I like to play around with Ustream, but today I'm actually not alone. Um, I, I have my, my guest is here with me, and he's with me for a very specific reason. Uh, because uh, uh, today my guest is James Wright. He's sitting, he's sitting here next to me. Hi, James. Hello. <laughs> and, uh, and, and filming uh, also is uh, Seamus uh, is, uh, is filming me, which is a friend of mine that I've had um, forever uh, since, uh, since 1998, the 90s. Uh, is, you know, the 90s, don't you think Seamus, the 90s were the best, the best decade? The 90s were the best decade. Yeah. Actually, I like this decade. Do I'm you? way thinner. You are thinner. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess whatever decade that you're skinnier in is, is the best is, decade. Is the is the best decade. Uh, so, but yeah, you do look really good. You you look good in the 2000s, Seamus. Um, too bad Seamus is not on camera. Um, but maybe later on we'll we'll uh, we'll we'll film him as well. Uh, so the reason why uh, my guest is uh, we are filming him. Well, I mean because we're in the same place. We're both in Highland Park. Yes. Yes. 
and uh, which which is kind of interesting, really, uh, that we're both on Highland. Yeah, kind of a synchronicity. It is, yeah, because you were you've only just been here for like a couple weeks. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and I've just not even been here a week yet, uh, because you know I just moved from Vancouver, Washington, and even though I have to say, even though it is a little bit better there because marijuana is legal for recreational use, <laughs> um, it's still not enough for me to stay in Vancouver. Um, I'm actually really happy to be back in Los Angeles, California, um, where there's fake palm trees. Uh, I, I, they're not fake; they're real, but they're not they're not indicative to this uh, to this area. I Nothing believe. here is. No, right. <laughs> <laughs> as well as should it be? Should it be? Yeah. No, I don't think so. Uh, it's it, we're we're in the land of illusion now. Um, but uh, but uh, oh, yeah, it, we're in La La Land, which which is weird because sometimes I feel more comfortable here. Which I don't know if that's a statement on myself. I'm not sure. No, I do too. So I. Can completely understand yeah well, it is more liberal here mm -hmm. yeah and uh, and and we and, and so I'm really excited the reason why James is here you know here's the thing James is a 32 degree Mason uh, whistleblower and uh, you know when you think about a 32 degree Mason you think of like some old man um, you know some old man in a suit and uh, you know curmudgeon yeah you think of a curmudgeon you know <laughs> and with with you know with with I don't know like an evil look in his eye and by the way talk about evil um, you know some people think that evil comes in uh, you know in, in obvious packages like Satanists with their dyed black hair and fake horns and black fingernail polish with white powder no evil looks like like you Evil looks like a person who wears a suit and a tie for a mugshot. Shout out to Rick Perry. Um, no, that's <laughs> no, that's that's evil. Did you see his mugshot? Yes, and as a Texan, I'm so glad to see him finally be held accountable for something. It seems to me though that they could take him down or on far worse things. Yeah. So it's kind of weird, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's like a little war between him and the DA office because he busted that DA, and now the DA is busting him and whatever. Texas politics are really weird. It so. seemed really, I mean, again, because you were telling me, because um, James and I hung out, we, 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 we drank um, Dr. Peppers, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I smoked a, I, I gave up cigarettes, but I did have one cigarette in the backyard, so, I mean, yeah. <laughs> two, two, two doc and he has his Dr. Pepper today. Shout out to Dr. Pepper, uh, the favorite drink by a 32 degree Mason. Um, so. <laughs> yes, hopefully someday they'll give me a sponsor. Right. <laughs> Um, and so, but, um, so Rick Perry, what are some of the other things that he did? Well, first of all, it seems to me that he's outstayed his term in office because he came into office in Texas when Bush got elected president. So he left early and stuck Rick Perry in as his favored person. And, uh, it's been one thing after another, after another with scandals and, and everything with him, like the, the GlaxoSmithKline thing and the HPV vaccines and, and everything else. And. Um, I mean, he's got a reputation going around. I'm, I'm quite familiar with the Austin area. My family had a ranch house there, so we would go and, you know, I, I know my way around Travis County and, and the rumors that that accompany Mr. Perry, and uh, he is a Mason. I mean, they all are, and uh, I don't think he's been representing the public ever, and, you know, they always come off as these, these nice guys or whatever, but honestly, when they were doing the last presidential uh, election nominations and and he was in that running and he was drunk on stage Do you oh really that? oh I, I don't remember that okay yeah, yeah. He, he made a drunken ass of himself in front of the entire nation and everybody just kind of brushed it off like oh um, okay I mean I would think that there would be some sort of accountability as the governor of a state to yeah. where you do that and, and you you know some sort of disciplinary action or something brought but no there wasn't nothing so. Well, you know, I mean, I would think so too. I would think so too. Um, I, too bad I missed that. I actually, when the presidential elections was going on, I was uh, trimming weed on a pot farm. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, I didn't. I missed a lot of all the all the fun of drunken candidates and stuff. Uh, well, you know, what, and just so you know, if you are, I I did put our. Um, I'm going to put it again. The UStream. Uh, if you want to click on and watch, I'm going to put it again in the chat room. Uh, I'm going to paste it right here if you want to watch us because you know what James is absolutely adorable I, you know you know I mean really he is you know he, you've got these little blonde eyelashes and stuff uh, so uh, yes I am a real blonde <laughs> he is a real <laughs> I won't 
don't go there. Um, <laughs> and so my friend uh, Lori Buckley is co-hosting. You, uh, she's in. Where are you at? You're in Studio City, aren't you, Lori? Uh, and that's what they call it. Yeah, North Hollywood. I'm just a hoe from NoHo. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a hoe from no ho. <laughs> and I was a hoe. I used to live in WeHo. Uh, but <laughs> we like <laughs> But according to Sean, I was the hoe of Pasadena. <laughs> I was there. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. Okay. <laughs> what is it? Like Sean Sean uh, Seamus. Seamus, Seamus Sean, whatever. Seamus um, you know, a host, we know each other from karaoke, and uh, and, and so I, I I did karaoke with him, uh, you know, at, to have fun on Sunday. And Seamus tells the audience, he goes, "Yeah, uh, I, I, the, Terry was a person that has I've had the, my most decadent experiences with in my whole life." <laughs> and I get up and I wave, "Hey!" <laughs> anyway, that's the past. So uh, I do want to take a moment here for the station. Uh, we are listener supported, and, uh, and and that's why we get to talk about these fabulous things and, and really tell the truth and uh, have freedom here because we don't have advertisers, and we are funded and we are supported by you. So uh, please do go to our website and, and support us and give us a donation at freedomslips.com. And uh, we, we really appreciate it, and we thank you so much for it. We have 17 days left of the month. And right now uh, we are at 1000 uh, no, $1,317. Uh, so our goal is $1,900, uh, and we've got 17 days to get there. So uh, please do give us uh, some support on that. And uh, we are still uh, on Facebook. Uh, we have a Facebook page, and so take a moment to like us on Facebook. Uh, a lot of us will like put our memes out there and, and show you where you know where we're playing at. I mean, we're not playing, but what our shows are and who's on it. So uh, make sure that you take a moment to do that as well. <clears throat> and uh, just a shout out for myself for a moment. Um, I'm also on Facebook at T E R E Joyce, uh, Terry Joyce. So uh, please take a moment to, if you want to be my friend, uh, send me a friend request. Uh, I have plenty of room still. I, I think I have 3,000 more friends I can have now. Uh, you know, I think I'm like 2,201 or something last time I saw it. And then I'm also at, uh, I have a Facebook uh, fan page, uh, Freedom of Joyce, and I have a group called the Global Freedom and Light Movement, and uh, if you want to get involved with that, there's several postings that go on there. As a matter of fact, uh, right now, a friend of mine who I have interviewed before here on Revolution Radio, uh, he is from Film the Police Portland. Uh, he is out in Ferguson, Missouri right now, uh, posting quite a few things, and so I just want to uh, give a shout out to uh, to my friend, Mike Bluehair Smith, and hopefully uh, I'd like to get him on the show to give us a report of what he has been experiencing. One of the things that I find interesting that he posted is that uh, there are some Christian groups uh, that are uh, also siding with the uh, police and asking people to, you know, not protest and you know, behave themselves, et cetera, et cetera. So I find it interesting that there are religious groups that are, uh, you know, suppressing and going along with uh, military police. Uh, so anyway, I just want to point that out for a second. And, uh, and, and, and I want to say screw you to YouTube. Uh, screw you, YouTube, right now, uh, because uh, you've now shut down uh, our YouTube channel on Revolution Radio three times. As a matter of fact, I'm giving YouTube the finger. Uh, right now uh, on Ustream, Ustream, uh, YouTube. I'm giving and like you know what? I'm gonna give a double finger uh, and uh, you know for suppressing information. And I want to say I have I practice. I I'm really good at giving the finger. By the way, uh, I practiced it. I practiced uh, giving the finger when I was 12. And I don't hold the fingers down like that, like some people do. I can like right, actually manipulate. Yeah, yeah, you manipulate your fingers. You know? <laughs> it might be really 70s to do it that way. I'm not sure. I mean, it, oh, it's the old school way of doing it. Yeah. Is it really? Well, yeah. people that don't have much practice, they'll just cock up their finger like that. Yeah, and, yeah. But yeah, you're supposed to do the the full. The full on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm a professional finger giver. Uh, <laughs> Stop it, Seamus. Sponsored by the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever had a moment where you wanted to give the peace sign and give the finger instead by accident? I have. 
No, I can't recall ever throwing the peace sign. Yeah, it's called Tourette's of the finger. Yeah. So um, I do it driving. You do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I try not to. I mean, I'm I'm working on um, anger management when I drive. I try I try not to, you know. But I'm back in LA, so. Uh, but now you can give someone the finger and boom. <laughs> You know, you get shot. Well, now, honestly, I think the drivers here are really nice. You hear these urban legends about driving in L.A., but it's not that way. Mm -hmm. Now, Texas is a different story. Really? The road rage is through the roof, but... Wow. Yeah, here, no. They actually let you merge in, and it's it's nice. <laughs> yeah, you, you don't want to mess, mess, mess with Texas. Yeah, they're, they're crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um... One of the things that did happen is uh, I, I, you know, I made it. I made a really good meme. Did you like the meme I made of you? Of you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. And you have your little, the little hat. My chauffeur cap. Yeah, yeah. your chauffeur cap. <laughs> now that's a special hat though, that you're wearing. Uh, is that is that the 32 degree Mason hat? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They call it the black hat. Yes. Okay. And then when I went to your house, you showed me some different some different hats. Did, yeah, the yeah. Uh, the black one is 32nd, like you said. There's a red one, which I don't have. That's for the little degree in between, the, which they call Knight Commander Court of Honor. And then there's the white one, which is 33rd, which I showed you that because I have my grandfather's. So. Uh -huh. yeah. um, there's some other hats like the uh, red fez of the Shriners and, and that kind of stuff. But other than that, that's, that's all the higher stuff because when you're just on the Blue Lodge, it's all about that white apron, and that's, that's really it. And then they're big on the lapel pins, as I was showing you my, yeah. my jewelry collection. I saw a lot of lapel pins. <laughs> I did. <laughs> there's, and they're they're nice. They're nice. And then there's oh, yeah. the little cuff links. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so. And my medal for the. I should have brought that. So I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. You know, we'll we'll film again. You know, we 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 were gonna maybe do the whole the whole you know shebang. Um, but uh, we'll do we'll do another more show and tell. Yeah, yeah, episode. yeah. But we do have something that we are going to show on camera. Yes. That will that will definitely prove that you are who you are. You know, I mean, not to say that you really <laughs> need to prove, but I mean, I did. I, I made the meme and I put it on Facebook, and some guy saw your picture and said, "Oh, you know, you know, this guy isn't old enough to be a 32." So that work I've had done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you kind of almost look like a teenager with the hat on, you know, a little bit. Yeah, I well. Mean, you look, you do look, you are young looking. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Just don't smoke too many cigarettes. Yeah. Well, because you know. Um, that and the tanning now in California and everything. Yeah, I'm gonna. Right. Turn into leather. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, but I got, you know, I had this guy, you know, say something kind of nasty about how he didn't believe that you were a 32 degree Mason, uh, because that you did look really young. And then, and then of course I, and I telling the truth posted back, you know, I made my comment and they go, I just met with him last night and I saw documents and everything and I'm the <laughs> host and we're going to be, <laughs> check us out on Ustream. No, I didn't say that because I didn't want to give it away. No, yeah, great. no, to give a recap for everybody, I did show you what I call my little evidence stash. Uh -huh. All the kind of documents that I had with me when I left there and, and everything. So that, you know, goes to show the nature of the place, the kind of money they have access to and, and everything. And um, as far as all that stuff is concerned, uh, there really is no denying that they are what people think they are which is to say a conglomerate that owns a lot of stuff, they're in charge of a lot of stuff, and uh, they try to uh, perpetuate this rumor now like they're just this harmless little tiny club, and that's just not the case. I mean, these are global, politico, power-pushing, you know, conglomerate guys. They're, they're a cabal. They're the very definition of that. So. It's it's good to you know meet you and hear you hear you talk about it because uh, you know a lot of times uh, you know you hear about the Freemasons and you hear a lot of people's stories about Freemasons and and uh, and then you might talk to somebody about the Freemasons and then they say oh you know you're a conspiracy theorist so that's not what's really going on and people don't really want to believe that and then to actually meet somebody and then interview you and hear your own testimony and then see the facts that you are who you say you are uh, is is uh, you know. No, I'm, I'm really pleased that you can vouch, because I so rarely get an opportunity to actually sit with another host, you know, face-to-face -face like mm -hmm. we're doing, and so I was really happy to show you that stuff, because, yeah, I get trolled all the time in these, mainly by Masons, who want to try and uh, play some game online or on Facebook or whatever to try and discredit me or make me look like I'm not who I say I am, and that's just not the case. I, I mean, you saw everything from 
my diploma all the way to enter office memos and, and my smartphone that I had at the time and, and everything else. So yeah, it's it's, it's real. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, he's he is he is the real deal. Uh, and okay, we're at eleven sixteen at the moment. Uh, Lori, uh, is there is there something that you would like to um, add at this moment? It's like thirty two degrees of separation. <laughs> There's such a study. A, a Sunday, uh, Sunday morning had a little episode on and showed the inside of the sanctuary. It's all dressed up. And I, I've always found them fascinating. And I also got to share in the things that only the men could look at. And I was so honored. And I've always been that girl that wanted to go where no women had gone before. And of course, I know that people do share with chicks. And Terry, you've seen it too. And I was really honored to have a look. But, you know, I never. I, I don't know, it just wasn't my thing. Like, what was it George Carlin said? The only safe groups are choirs, you know? And it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, I, I, it will be interesting to hear more of your story. And, uh, and, and I was curious, have you, uh, ever hung with other people that left the group also? Yes, as a matter of fact, um, the more, I mean, my, uh, my book was published on January of 2012. And right after that was when I got like my first radio interview and all that. And the, the more time has gone on, the more this has blown up and become, you know, like this big deal. And I've had more and more and more brothers from that environment get in touch with me and, and say, you know, yeah, you're, you're right. I can't stand it either. I left back on date and, and blah, blah, blah. Here's the reasons why. And really, I mean, one thing that these stories all have in common, regardless of who it is or why they left, is they got sick and tired of the, for want of a better word, the assholiness of the place. You know, these guys that, they, they're such hypocrites, they, because most, okay, most guys right now that come into the order, they're looking for a higher education in the metaphysical, the esoteric, all of that, like a college education, so to speak, like the old school, the Greek philosophers, and and those kind of Socratic methods of learning and, and everything else. And uh, what they're finding is that is there. However, they have to uh, pretend to be something they're not the whole entire time. So basically, in other words, they have to act like it's all one big Rotary Club meeting and that there's absolutely nothing occulted, nothing spiritual, no, and this notion that Freemasonry is a religion, that's true, but to admit that or behave like it or whatever is a big no-no within the order. They don't want anybody doing that. And it's all part of this public relations image that they're trying to push right now, which is, you know, we're harmless, there's, there's none of that going on, that's like the whole thing with Albert Pike, they're on this big kick right now saying, oh no, Albert Pike had nothing to do with the place, that uh, morals and dogma is a forgery, and blah, blah, blah. And that's just more of their lies. They want to try and make it look like they're just harmless and it's a dinner club or whatever. And in some cases, in the Blue Lodge level, the lower level it is, but you get up into the Scottish Rite and all of that stuff and uh, it's, <laughs> it's very, very occulted. Party going on, that's why they close those doors. Right, and it's not until you're a 32nd degree Mason that they start um, bringing you into these what they call the by invitation only groups. So all, there's all these other degrees and, and groups to join, and, and there's guys who are literally they'll take out their wallet and like some cartoon, the, the flop, 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 you know, card will expand and you'll have this whole two dozen like dues cards, different groups appended to. Freemasonry, but all attached and in that octopus network. So that's um, the name of the game. Thanks. Wow, what a study. It's amazing. It took you a while to figure it out because you obviously went there because you felt it was an honorable situation. What exactly got you into being Mason? My family. It ran very uh, deeply in my family. It goes back as far as well timed itself uh, and before there was such thing as the masons then you know it was the templars and before that the priory of sion and, and all of those things so that's all real and it kind of changes forms i mean not the whole thing but you get these splinter groups off of it as time goes on and they adapt and change uh, to the times and everything so um my grandfather was a former chairman of the board 
of the Scottish Rite, very prominent in uh, 33rd, obviously. And um, so I got to be about 22, 23, and it was put to me by my aunt and some other people that, you know, okay, it's, it's time for you to go do this. So I did, and uh, I really enjoyed it at, at first. I, I didn't see a problem in the world with it, you know, just on that that Blue Lodge level and <clears throat> going to charity events and things like that, uh, there is no problem with it. And there's a lot of good guys involved in it. But then once I became a 32nd and really started getting immersed more and more in the Scottish Rite, and then they came and headhunted me for that position working there on the Supreme Council, that's when things changed. And it was not what I thought it was. And I encountered, you know, the utmost evil and, and hostility that, that they have in the place, so which a lot of Masons don't ever get to see unless they engage that that higher echelon, you know, for whatever reason there may be. Uh, also, I just want to point out, too, um, how many degrees were there? Well, there's a total of 33. I guess um, you could argue 34 with that KCCH degree, but then see, that's just the, the main apparatus of the system because you have all these little different uh, degrees that come off of that and then when you take into account like things like the York Rite for example then you're dealing with uh, an, an additional six degrees and all these other things and uh, the shrine has like two or three and, and then there's the Eastern Star and it just it, they keep going and going and by the end of the day when you ta start tabulating all these groups that come off of Freemasonry and all their degrees, I mean, you're, you're up in the, the hundreds, if not thousands. There's just so many. I also want to point out that uh, just uh, I'm uh, in, in studio, studio, it's not really a studio, but in, <laughs> in house, I guess we, could, we should say, uh, as James Robert Wright, who is a 32-degree 32, 32 Mason uh, whistleblower. Uh, I did have a friend on Skype ask me if, if I was talking to James Wright. So uh, I want to make sure that uh, that yes, uh, that that you, you, this is you. Yes. And uh, if if you do want to, would you, would you like to card me? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice to your ID, sir. <laughs> uh, so I I find it interesting um, that uh, I, I looked over your book a little bit uh, last night. Uh, you just sent it to me last night. You sent me the ebook version of it. And one of the things uh, that I noticed was that you t the chapter about um, about you being gay and mm -hmm. uh, and a Mason as well, and uh, and I didn't get to really look too much of an of an overview. But was how was that? Was, is that conflicting? Uh, is it accepted? Um, um, well, it it depends on where you are. It's not really accepted for me personally. I never had a problem uh -huh. until I was in that administrative position with the Supreme Council, and then it turned into a situation where it's like there were guys that were jealous that I had that job, and so they wanted to find a problem with me, even if they just had to grasp at straws to get the problem, and so they took that and made it into one. Okay. And it's, uh, but no, up until that point, I never encountered any kind of bigotry or whatever. Now, that's not the case in some other brothers' stories. There's guys that have had a, a horrible time just because, uh, either they were found out to be gay or they decided to come out of the closet in their life while they were a Mason or while they were in some kind of uh, position in their local lodge or, or whatever, and it seems to uh, spike a lot of hatred and, and actions taken against them. And it goes to show the corruptive nature of this cabal because you have actions taken against these guys where, like, uh, the local sheriffs are suddenly giving them tickets all the time, traffic tickets, or this, yeah, it, just all this stuff. And uh, matter of fact, on my show, Dial Information, I leaked some audios, never before heard, and in it there's this uh, sort of a mass attack going on in the, in the form of what they call a Masonic trial, which is usually a bunch of BS. Um, and they're, they're attacking this guy, and it's all the, it's somewhere in the south, I'm, I won't give away the location because it would just put him in additional danger, but um, they just go around the room, and, and you can tell, I mean, there's judges and lawyers and police and, and everybody present within the membership of just this one lodge that he was a member of, and they just gang whatever, just attack him and, and totally make his life a living hell. 
All because he came out of the closet. You know, what a crime. So, <laughs> that's, uh... That's the way it is. Well, yeah, and, and they had the nerve of telling me around the time I was leaving that, oh, you're the only gay mason in Texas. I'm like, um, no, I think we can use that one in ten rule to, yeah, no. That's, that's ridiculous. And besides all of which, all of the, the propositions I got for illicit hanky-panky in the building when I worked in the Scottish Rite, I mean, it was through the roof. It was every day. Someone, and usually married men, and I came to resent that. Oh, wow. It's, it's disgusting. Yeah, especially when they're married. Well, yeah, because it, it, would, it would have been a situation where had I have done it, I would be expected to, like, continue going to black tie events and sitting and shaking hands and smiling with their wives and things, and that's just not me. I can't do that. So that's, uh, that's where it really started to go horribly wrong. And uh, when I left, even that stuff came up again because it was like, oh, well, you know, if you hop into bed with me or me or, or whatever, you know, we can help you and we can make all this go away, and uh, I just wasn't willing to do it. Well, women face that all the time. Yeah, it's it's gross. To, it is gross. What you, you trust someone in, in an environment, a work environment, and then you have that happen. Yeah. It's like, so why am I even here? Why, is that why I was brought on to begin with? You were hoping to score? <laughs> yeah. yeah it's... Well, we'll be right back with more Freedom of Joyce after this break. Stay with us. to, um, you know, like maybe if, if he's just talking, you know, have you do, you, you know, however, like you're keeping it at two shut. That's to be like a director or something like that. I'm here for you. <laughs> and then, um, we're going to make sure that we get this. This is the, um, uh, Morals and Dogma book. This is the real deal, people. The real thing. This is the book that nobody says exists. There it is. Yep. There it is. Women don't normally get to touch this, right? Right. Okay, I'm gonna say that on the air too. Yeah, I can see if something happens to you. Oh, for Scottish right. Ooh, to be returned upon withdrawal or death of a recipient. <laughs> if, <laughs> if something happens to me, they go, you know, she touched that book. <laughs> Okay. He's begging me to put some of the other guy on. Yes, that's Scotty and I'll be trying to create on some crazy ones. Okay. 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 Okay.
with everything that we offer. So, folks, keep your data safe for your peace of mind. Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. Uh, we're back with the Freedom of Joyce show on Revolution Radio. With me is my guest, uh, James Robert Wright, who is a 32-degree Mason uh, whistleblower. And uh, co-hosting with me is Lori Buckley. And Seamus is, is, uh, is with me uh, filming us uh, on Ustream at the Freedom of Joyce channel. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, there is a bit, and I want to get to this right away because I, I, I want to make sure that as soon as my battery runs out on my cell phone, because we're streaming off my cell phone right now, which is an HD, which is kind of cool. Cool. Uh, right now, I have a, a, a book in my hand, which um, women are not supposed to touch. Uh, <laughs> as a matter of fact, uh, anybody who is a, uh, who is not a, a Scottish Rite Mason should be touching it. Uh, as a matter of fact, on the inside, uh, it says, uh, oh wait, I don't want to get yeah, it. Yeah, that's like it says, uh, esoteric book for Scottish Rite use only to be returned upon withdrawal or death of recipient. Uh, so <laughs> I dropped it really quick when I first read that. Uh, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, oh, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> um, I'm not keeping it or anything like this, but this is the uh, morals and dogma book. And this is the book where people believe doesn't d that this is not real. Well, it is real, and I'm holding it in my hand holding it up uh, to, to the camera. And Seamus, can you get a better shot of what that is? Uh, I'm, I'm showing it. Um, it's, it's a red book, uh, kind of a red coat book. Um, it's kind of heavy. Yeah. Um, and uh, on the side, it says Morals and Dogma uh, right here. I'm, I'm, I'm letting it be filmed uh, for, for um, a moment. And, uh, and, uh, and, and it's, got a, it's got an eagle on it. Why, why does it have an eagle on it? That's the symbol of the Scottish Rite. Oh, okay. So the the double-headed eagle. Okay, the double-headed eagle, uh, which is the phoenix rising. You said. Yes. Yes, the, I remember because we talked about it the night before. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, and it, it's uh, how many pages? Let me see. How many pages does it have? Five million. Five. <laughs> wow. It's a. Uh, it's it, It's quite. Now, when do you get this book? When does when does this book come into your being? Well, that's uh, something that's kind of changed a little bit. It used to be an automatic thing that they would give a master mason. Then, uh, around, I guess the 50s, the 60s, it changed, and um, now it's something that they give a 32nd degree mason. Of course, in the last 20 years, uh, they've been kind of low on copies, so you kind of have to be one of their little special poster children, poster boys, you know, and, and uh -huh. they'll give you a copy. And of course, it's if you if something happens, you know, you're supposed to give it back and all that because they have a stash room that they keep in the Scottish Rite Valleys in every major city. So um, this is an older printing, like the, the more recent ones around the 50s when they before they stopped printing them, period, uh, doesn't have that little blurb about, you know, return upon death and, uh -huh. and all of that. Um, but what they're doing right now, this this is pretty important as a piece of literature, not necessarily for what it says, because personally I think Albert Pike was kind of full of crap, but mm -hmm. uh, they're denying now, they, they send out their apologists from the Supreme Council on the History Channel or Discovery Channel, wh wherever they may go. Uh, one recently did uh, the Vinnie Eastwood show, Vinnie's a good friend of mine, and uh, they, they are promoting this lie now that, oh, this book does not exist, it's uh, any copies you might find, those are forgeries, Albert Pike never wrote it, blah, 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 and that's just not the case. And they, and they deny who he was to the order because they're so tired of combating all of like the, the facts that... This is Luciferianism pure, from cover to cover, it, or the fact... This is Luciferianism right yeah, here. Okay. This is Luciferian doctrine, okay. the whole thing. All right. And um, the fact that he designed the rituals for the KKK and, and all of that, I mean, he was a pretty bad person. Matter, matter of fact, he's the only person who was 
tried for treason against the United States government, who there is a statue of in the streets of Washington, D.C. Go figure. So, and he uh, lived out the rest of his life in Canada, I think, and um, now his body is at the House of the Temple, the headquarters of the Supreme Council in Washington, D.C., which they use in the ritual of the 31st degree, Inspector Inquisitor, and they have a, a deceased mason who God only knows what means they got a hold of these corpses, but they have a corpse on hand, mummified in every major city, every valley in the world that they use in that degree, which one would think, okay, why not just get a stage prop, but that's what they do. They use it as a stage prop, and it's, it's necromancy. Wow. Okay. <laughs> They're a cheeky group of folks, aren't they? I mean, it's, that's kind of wild. Uh, uh, what was it, how did your family feel when they found out that you were going to bolt? Did you question them or ask them or ask them why they behaved this way, or did you just kind of make up your own mind and then tell them how you felt and, and then you bolted? How did, how did it go? I made up my own mind, and I told them after the fact. There was about a week, one week mm -hmm. that went by where they didn't really know what was going on, there was still a lot of confusion about the issue and everything, and then once they did find out, they weren't very happy about it, but they decided that, I guess they were just kind of, you know, whatever, we'll just forget about this and, and go on. And then, many months later, about six, seven, eight months later, when I made the decision that I was going to start writing this book and publish that and come out publicly against them, that's when I ran into problems, and my aunt came to me and told me, you know, burn whatever you've written so far, and you're an embarrassment to this family, and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, well, <laughs> I've never been in trouble a day in my life, and all of your kids are, like, addicted to crack and heroin, and, you know, it just it, all kinds of sick stuff. And so I, I found that kind of... Was she worried about for you? Was she scared for you that maybe something dark would happen to you? No, she was more worried about her own reputation around town. Because she... <laughs> well, yeah, that's um, kind of what... Well, I mean, my family is really deranged. That's all, all they can think of in terms is like what people at the country club might think. And so the fact that I had a real problem or that these guys were causing me problems was not of any concern to them. Tell, tell us a little bit about your family, cool. where, where you come from. Well, I come from Dallas. I'm a sixth generation Dallasite to the city. Um, so my family was one of those founding families and everything. Uh, we built the media in North Texas. So that would include the Dallas Times-Herald, KRLD 1080 AM talk ra news radio. Uh, this, the news station that is now modern day CBS 11. It used to be KRLD TV. Uh, so we were quite prominent, and we had a few other businesses as well, um, in timber and oil and all that kind of stuff. And um, we were quite the force to be reckoned with. We were very mafioso. And see, I was born in 1982, so I kind of came in at the tail end of that stuff. Because once grandparents started dying and, and all of that, and, and the power and the money kind of shifted to like, mother and aunt's generation and all that, it, they just kind of effed it off and and everything kind of went away and we became really kind of the laughing stock of Dallas, I would say, just because of all, mainly stuff my cousins did, you know, their horrible uh, infractions with the law and drugs and, and everything else, which ultimately, I mean, they have responsibility in that for their actions, but I think that their drug problems and and everything else stem from the programming and everything else in our family because I mean it was pretty thick and I mean growing up I mean it was a house where it was very political and we had people like LBJ over dinner guests and you know I mean so we were definitely power brokers in the area and um, I myself growing up in Texas like, as a, a gay teenager, I never had a problem with anything because I think people around town were too scared to mess with me. You know, like, oh, it, there's no telling what they'll do to us or whatever. So I kind of got off scot-free with that. So it was very shocking to me when I dealt with bigotry for the first time at the Scottish Rite when I got into that job there and everything. So um, I don't know. It's just... 
it's I, I've kind of I grew up I was born into this this empire and then watched it fall my entire childhood piece by piece so that was very interesting and um, now I mean there's barely o only old Dallasites would even recall any of, of what I just described because they had this big corporate influx there and the population exploded and it's just not the same city that, that I was born into. Uh, now, what, go, go deeper, because aren't you like, your bloodline, does your bloodline go back to, is, is it connected to the monarchy? Or? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. See, and that's another thing, my, uh, my family right now in, in Texas, like my mother, my aunt, they go on and on and on about how wonderful it is that we're related to figures like Stephen F. Austin, one of the fathers of Texas, and uh, the Milums, and uh, God, who else? The Lees, Robert E. Lee of the Confederacy, all of that. But they leave it at that, and they don't ever dare go any deeper. And the fact is, is that's just a drop in the bucket compared. I mean, because we've got—I sent you some of my yeah. genealogy, mm -hmm. and I mean, we've got people everywhere, all the way from Princess Diana to every president, that's true, that they're all related, yeah. and my genealogy is proof of that, and uh, going all the way back to figures like Charlemagne or, um, or Dagobert or y even further back, we go back into Roman names and the Julii and, and all those people, so it is accurate to say that this Merovingian stuff that you, you hear about, that is true, and they are all related. And matter of fact, those bloodlines are very prominent here in Hollywood, mm -hmm. for whatever that's worth. Mm. And it's, it's interesting, because no one ever goes to the person and says, oh, well, you're of this bloodline, so we w it's always something that they just track in the background. Oh, really? Yeah. And then if you want to know, you have to find out the hard way yourself. They're never forthcoming. So somebody could be a bloodline, and they wouldn't know, but they'd already tracked it. Oh, right, yeah. Okay. I, I have a question. Now, the Masons, y y do you have to be a bloodline to be a Mason, or can you um, No, not but be? there's a funny thing that happens, and there's no explanation for it, really. Um, most of the guys who end up choosing to become one and take it to its sort of heights, you know, as a 32nd or, or whatever, in every single case, they are, mm -hmm. and there's no explanation for it. Um, I mean, when I was on the Supreme Council, I, I reviewed those statistics and everything, and there was no way to explain the fact that everybody there is related. <laughs> They're cousins, basically. So, um, I don't know. It's, it's strange. Well, I mean, because I, I was always curious of, well, kind of somewhat curious about it. I mean, I, I, mean, I, 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 knew, I knew that there was some sort of bloodline uh, connection, um, just kind of... Uh, well, I mean, like, actually, I have some uncles that are Masons, and then my mom was a Job's daughter, so, and I kind of realized that there was some relation to, that's why she was, uh, yeah. you know, and, and et cetera, and so I, I was, I've had arguments with people about it. Yeah, maybe. Job's daughters, Rainbow Girls, uh, Dee Malay, those are the youth groups, yeah. which a lot of Masons will put their, their kids or their nieces, nephews, whatever in, so, yeah. So, I want to get... Um, some will, but ordinarily it's not something that they tend to bring up because they don't like the discussion because once again it's one of these talking points that, that everybody suspects about them and that they don't want to publicly admit and they don't want to be publicly quoted on or, or anything like that. So yeah, they were very well aware of what my genealogy was, but I personally wasn't because that was always withheld from my mother, my aunt. It was just that that pink elephant in the room that no one ever wanted to discuss. And the same thing with the Masons. And so you have to ask yourself, why? Why is that? Why I don't have all the answers as to why they are so adamantly opposed to engaging that subject matter, but they don't like it. That's the fact. And the fact, the other fact is, is that they, you know, it's true. It's it's all true. It probably, it, it probably has something to do with uh, affecting the membership. Do they keep, do they keep records of everybody's background that, that involved them? Oh, yes. They have, um, the archives are beneath the Dallas Valley at 500 Harwood in downtown Dallas. Yeah. 
You know, I got. I'm getting a message uh, from uh, from Tony Diaz on Skype, and he says, "Tell James that I'm listening, and he knows that my grandfather was killed by the Masons." Do you know? Do you, you know about that, Tony? Tony Diaz. Um, well, he's also. Um, uh, I'm a 15 generation ma Mason. Is what he's saying. Uh, he, uh, he's also known as as Max Steele. Okay. Yeah, Max. Okay. Yeah, All right. yeah I've talked to him before. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, they love to kill their own when you don't go along with whatever the program is. And they, it starts with, they'll do like a Masonic trial so that they're, they're pulling you down and, and humiliating you in public in front of your community or, or whatever and trying to, because you can't unmake a Mason, that's the problem. So you can sit there and go, oh, well, you're going to be suspended or expelled or, or whatever, but you can't take away the fact that they have been through those rituals and know those secrets and, and everything else. And that's a real thorn in their side. They wish they could, you know. So, um, yeah, that anytime you go against the program, whatever they're wanting, whatever the goals are, or whatever, they will put you through the ringer. And a lot of people don't survive it. I want to. Uh, I want to get to. I mean, it, it's like 11:47. We got a little bit more time. Um, there's a couple of passages that you have bookmarked mm -hmm. uh, on, on the book, and uh, and I and I you, I'd like you to read them sure. if you could. All right. So, uh, and and why specifically have you booked like for example each one? Why did you bookmark this one, and why why do you think it's that you feel that it's relevant for people to know about? Well, this is the stuff about. Uh Lucifer that people you know you can Google this stuff and, and see it on there but then see Masons and everybody will come back and go oh that's made up oh no that's not true that doesn't exist whatever and no it is true and it was written and Lucifer is the god of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry that's just the fact so they can lie all they want and say oh no 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 but yeah no that's that's a lie so uh, uh, this stuff here, it's just talking about uh, the Kabbalah. Actually, I don't know why I put what this one is. Okay. The true name of Satan, the Kabbalists say, is that of Yahweh reversed. For Satan is not a black god, but the negation of God. The devil is the personification of atheism or idolatry. For the initiates, this is not a person, but a force created for good, but which may serve for evil. It is the instrument of liberty or free will. They represent this force which presides over the physical generation under the mythologic and horned form of the god Pan. Thence came the he-goat of the Sabbat, brother of the ancient serpent, and the light-bearer or phosphor of which the poets have made the false Lucifer of the legend. So that kind of openly claims that. <laughs> and then uh, as we read on... Yeah, this, this is the more famous passage here, which does exist, so okay. that's, that's a myth that it doesn't. The apocalypse is, to those who receive the 19th degree, the apotheosis of that sublime faith which aspires to God alone and despises all the pomps and works of Lucifer. Lucifer, the light bearer, strange and mysterious name to give to the spirit of darkness. Lucifer, the son of the morning. Is it he who bears the light? and with its splendors, intolerable, blinds, feeble, sensual, or selfish souls. Doubt it not, for traditions are full of divine revelations and inspirations. And inspiration is not of one age or of one creed. Plato and Philo were also inspired. So, <laughs> it does exist. It's all right here. Yeah, you know, I, I remember reading that passage, the, the, you know, when you showed me the book, you know, a couple, couple nights ago. Uh, so thank you, thank you for sharing that uh, with me. Um, yeah, and to you know, to diehard collectors who want to try and find one of these, occasionally you can find one on Amazon, but you run a better chance like at uh, Half Price Books and, and other used bookstores where a lot of times uh, someone will die and the kids come in not knowing you know what it is and they just send off a truckload of books to be donated or whatever, and then you can actually come across these. So. Uh, I'm actually getting a, a message from uh, from Tony Diaz. He he actually would like to be um, to, to to come into the show and uh, and and also you know we are going into the second hour so uh, you know if anybody wants to call 
and, and, and call in and ask a question to James uh, or myself, um, yeah, well, specifically for you, <laughs> um, you can uh, call us at 347-688-2902. I will be opening up the lines here after the break and, and, and continue with, with the show. I really want to thank you for, for bringing this book. Yeah. Um, because, uh, and, uh, and, and that's one of the reasons why we wanted to live stream or you stream to be together because we wanted to show the evidence that yeah. um, the book actually really uh, exists. <laughs> and, you know, so, um, yeah, it's very, it's very interesting. And, and I'm sure that uh, Tony Diaz, Max Steele, you know, has, has a lot to, uh, a lot to, to, to add to the show. Um, Lori, did you, before we go to the break, did you want to, is there something that you want to say? Well, um, the, it's all about conformity with these people. So you're not really allowed much leeway to pursue whatever you might want to as far as uh, what you're studying or, or whatever. And, I mean, they keep, uh, they, they have this group called the Scottish Rite Research Society, which I was on. You have to be a 30 seconds to join that. And that's when you get to actually start going through and investigating uh, like the, the manuscripts and things that they have on hand, which they've got some manuscripts that go back into like BC times, but they keep this stuff under lock and key, and so you're never really allowed to do anything that's actually worthwhile, you know, as, as long as it's playing into their, what they want, what they want as an image and, and all of that, then they'll let you do it, but other than that, you, you find that you're always getting your hand slapped, you know, no, 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 not authorized, no. So. Are they obligated to come to every meeting once you're a member, or are there those like they call the Jack Mormons? Are there some are there some Jack Masons that don't come up to everything, or and, and they just kind of allow them to be that way? How how does it work? Well, I mean, in a perfect world, in their minds, yeah, every Mason would come to every meeting, but uh, that's just not the reality of it. I mean, so many of those guys have uh, family and and work or whatever obligations that they can't make them. Um, but there are some very diehard Masons who try to make every meeting and they join multiple Blue Lodges and they belong to the York Rite, the Scottish Rite, the Shrine, and all of these by invitation only, they'll belong to a good dozen of those and, and all of that. So uh, those are the ones who typically get the 33rd and uh, go places. I mean, I was going places simply because I was available for a lot of, of stuff. Uh, you know, one of the things that I, I wanted to, uh, to bring up to you, James, uh, as I was thinking, is uh, when did you realize, I mean, like, you, you go along, and, and again, obviously, if you're on the lower levels, you don't know that it's Luciferian, so right. when you did realize that it was... Uh, well, but then again, um, just the night I was initiated, I already saw some overtones and things like uh, what they call the circumambulation of the lodge and, and that kind of stuff. It was pretty apparent to me simply being someone who had been down the aisle, the metaphysical aisle of a bookstore in my life, that there were magical components. You know, they were basically opening a circle. There were invocations going on and, and all that kind of stuff. So you can, you can look at the pattern of the Masonic ritual and see that, yeah, it is based in magic and and that kind of stuff so um but inherently those kind of rituals aren't necessarily always like let's say dark would it be i mean uh it, well yeah no, that's true but um uh, it depends on where the the person the practitioner is is taking it so okay. it's that whole is it a left hand or a right hand path and the left hand path would be like your sith you know the evil the quick way and, and all of that and consequently that's why Freemasonry is in the problem and the situation that it's in is because you're never going to get to one of those leadership positions if you're a nice guy because you don't have what it takes as a nice guy to 
get to that and all the backstabbing, throat cutting, and, and everything else that goes on. So, but but when Freemason, when when it started, I mean, like when did Albert Pike came on later on, didn't he? Right. Wasn't there a time where it wasn't this way? He just kind of renovated the uh, the what is now called the Scottish Rite and put those degrees together. Um, Gosh, we have to go to a break. Uh, I <laughs> should have been paying attention to the time. We'll be right back with more Freedom of Joyce uh, with James Robert Wright, and we're going to add Tony Diaz to the uh, to the show as well. Stay with us. How you doing? Good. <laughs> Tired. <laughs> I don't think I've ever held a phone up this long. Yeah, hold on just a second. Yeah. Yeah, I know I'm doing the survey thing right now. Is, have they already sent it? Yeah. Shit. They sent it like not that long after she uh, texted. Okay, do we need to talk to them on the phone? 
No. It's an online thing. Okay. I'm going to pull it up. <laughs> it asks how many, how many alcoholic beverages do you consume in a week? <laughs> to the Freedom of Joy show on Revolution Radio with me is James Robert Wright. Co-hosting with me is Lori Buckley. We have Seamus uh, uh, streaming it on Ustream. I'm gonna, if you do want to watch us, I'm going to push this into the, uh, the chat one more time. Here's the link to watch the show uh, if you want to watch at the same time. And uh, I also want to, again, give a plug to the station. Uh, we are listener supported. And, uh, and, and we thank you so much for supporting us. And we do still need your support this month. We have 17 days left. We are at 1,317 donations. We need to bring that up to 1,900 by the end of the month. And you know what? If everybody gave just a dollar, uh, you know, let's say we had, you know, 100,000 listeners and everybody gave a dollar, that would be $100,000, and that would be really cool. So, yeah. you know, you know, you know, then, then we'd have to throw a party. And then we have to. <laughs> <laughs> James and I will throw a party here. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll run out uh, Hearst Castle. <laughs> <laughs> Right now, uh, it, we have uh, Tony Diaz uh, well, you know, joining us uh, online. Tony was wanting to, to speak with you. Welcome to the show, Tony. Well, thank you. I appreciate uh, y'all uh, allowing me to be here. And by the way, I am going to, I donated already uh, a couple of days ago. I am going to donate again. Wonderful. Thank you so much for, for making for giving us a donation and keeping us going, Tony. And uh, so now you, I didn't realize this, but you're, you're a Mason as well. Yes, uh, I became a Mason in 2006. Uh, I really didn't want to be a Mason. Um, I, I have 15, I'm, I'm actually 15 generation. Uh, everybody in my whole family goes back, even back to the uh, Knights of the Templar. Uh, I didn't really want to be one, but I, I, I did learn, I did go in. And uh, I had two people here that know me in, this, in the town that I live in, and they were high. They were high in the Masons, uh, 32nd and 33rd, and they voted me to go in. So I did. I, I actually joined in 2006, a, and then I became a Master Mason. I did not want to go any higher because uh, the things that I was seeing. But really, I joined to find out and get information. One reason. Uh, every time that I would talk with my family, they would give me nothing because uh, of the secrecy involved. But uh, I was able to uh, make friends inside. Uh, actually, we have here a hundred and uh, hundred forty-four Masons, and I became. I'm sorry, a hundred fourteen Masons, and I became the one fifteen Masons, and I was the first. Uh, uh, Cuban American to be voted in, in this county here because this county is uh, very racist and uh, somehow I was able to avoid that and became a, uh, a Mason in 2006. Um, I actually, uh, my, my my father was a Mason. Uh, he, he was a 32nd degree uh, my grandfather was a 32nd also. I mean, uh, and uh, also, uh, my grandfather was killed in, uh, 
Thirty-three. Yeah, it's a myth that the thirty-third is the highest level, and that goes to show how the whole thing is really nothing more than a pyramid scheme. When you want to look at it in basic through a very basic lens like that, because these guys will uh, hop, skip, and jump chasing that carrot their entire lives, hoping for that thirty-third degree, and then once they get it, they find out that there's actually degrees and honors above that in that procession of degrees, and then there's all this other stuff as well. So yeah, it's. Uh, there's always something more. Huh. Uh, also, somebody from the chat uh, asked a question. They said they wanted to know about the Space Masons. What, what is that? Yeah, uh, there is a lodge in Houston, Texas called Tranquility Lodge, number 2000. And their website is, I think, tl2k.org or .com, one of the two. Anyway, um, that's where all of the astronauts and uh, NASA personnel, uh, Fred Kleinecht, one of the former sovereign grand commanders of the Scottish Rite, he was a director of NASA. Uh, they're, they're, they've always had involvement with that and on the moon there's the American flag and there's also the purple Scottish Rite flag flying right alongside of it. So the whole line, Houston the Eagle has landed, that was a Masonic uh, little communicate there to the guys in Houston that, you know, the, the, the eagle, the Scottish Rite eagle has landed. Unbelievable. Yeah. But they're, that's so prevalent everywhere. One of the things I noticed, I, I, I found, uh, I was in Utah uh, last September, and I had gone to the Comic-Con there uh, and worked on a documentary and everything because it was the first, anyway. What was interesting was to see the uh, combination of the Mormon religion uh, with, uh, with with the Freemasons. Yeah. Now, what is all? Of, do you know what that's all about? Uh, the prophet of the Mormons, Joseph Smith, he was a Mason, and he left and took the Blue Lodge rituals, which is what he used to formulate the uh, Mormon temple rituals. So it's it's all one and the same thing. And the Masons were so furious with him over having done that that they killed him. And they shot him in the face at Point Blake Range in broad daylight. And that, along with the killing of William Morgan, almost about did them in. There was such a public outcry throughout the 1800s of that stuff that they really took a hit and had to kind of go underground right before the turn of the century for about 50 years almost. They, they waited for all the, the outrage to die down and, and then came back out with this new product called the Scottish Rite. So. <laughs> I didn't know the history of uh, in, in that way. I just, it, it was it was really obvious. I mean, the minute I, I stepped outside. Well, yeah, so, uh, I mean, and I don't, you know, there's a lot of people, there's, Mormons are shiny, happy people as, as things tend to go, but they don't realize that, I mean, Joseph Smith being a prophet, that's no different than saying that Aleister Crowley was a prophet. All, the only thing they did was take Masonic material and bring it into this new group they were formulating and saying, oh yes, this was divinely inspired or whatever. Well, no, it, it's what they, as Masons, wrote down and, and formed as this new order that they were starting. There, there was no angelic or 
higher extraterrestrial intervention, or as they claim, it's that's all a load of crap. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I did not know that. That is that is that is good to know. Uh, Lori, uh, like, would you like? Uh, hello, Lori. Hi. I'm, <laughs> I'm curious. Was there any uh, afterlife promise as, as a mason that you go up into higher levels, or you're in more of the sacred cloud? Is there is, is it all concerning uh, this life that we see, or did it did they say that you would be go beyond that in another sacred council or something? Well, they have this attitude in Freemasonry as a whole that you can almost sort of buy a ticket into heaven, so to speak, so long as you're, like, you can be a horrible, you could be Hitler, but as long as you're giving money to charity and, and doing charitable causes and things, contributing whatever, then, uh, then that's supposed to bypass whatever karma you've racked up that's bad and, and then you're able to enjoy a, a nice, happy afterlife or whatever. And they only ever identify God as the grand architect of the universe. Uh, Christ does not come up anywhere inside of Freemasonry at all, period. Hmm. Very interesting. That is interesting. Well, they were people of, they, they were people of the now, and also uh, extra trusting the bloodline. Uh, and that was their most of their carrier of their uh, the things that they appreciated was this life more than, than anything past that. Yeah, and I mean, again, it's something that you really can't explain because I mean, what is the reason why these guys who are bloodline go into it and are attracted to it and everything else? There, there is no common theme there is no unifying factor there's there's nothing it, it's just it is what it is and it's it's weird so it just the same way that all these people prominent figures in Hollywood are bloodline there's not some uh, selection process going on or, or you know where you submit your genealogy or whatever they just they know already because they track this stuff and then when you're of that then you're kind of allowed to join the club so you just traced the fact that you were your 11th cousin, is it 11th cousin of Robin Williams? Yeah, I just looked that up the other day and yeah, he's bloodline. <laughs> hmm. I'm surprised everybody didn't have a DNA test, just to be sure. <laughs> well, yeah, see, you can, a lot of people opt for that and you can do that and it will narrow down, you know, exactly what your origins are and all of that, but doing your genealogy the, the old school way, That'll at least provide you with the list of names and, and everything of, of how that came to be, and uh, it, it gets very complicated because the further you go back, I mean, every one of us we all have four grandparents, and each one of those people had four grandparents, and uh, so you, you're always going back for it, it. It webs out and it becomes really, uh, really crazy, and, and there's so much information to sift through and everything. But what what interests them the most? is when you have multiple tie-ins, so if you have like a, a three or a four-way connection back into the same figure, say Charlemagne or, or whoever, uh, that's what really gets them more interested in you above the next person. So like me, for example, I've got a four-way tie-in to the St. Clairs, uh, to the Spencers, to the Hamiltons, to, oh gosh, so many others, the, the St. Martins, uh, the list goes on and on, and uh, that's exactly what they look for when they're looking to either, well, to put it one way, to make a public person uh, with a public profile. So. Uh, I like uh, the coat of arms. My family, there's lots of, the, they have the silver, they have the gold, and uh, uh, a, 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 and another color, kind of black, and, uh, and they have lots of heads of cattle in it. I said we were either full of all or we were in the cattle business. I'm not sure which it was. Hmm. But they must have used that also as a qualifying factor, the coat of arms of people's lives. Well, most of those coat of arms are so rife with symbology. Um, there's, there's all because you got to remember when you're dealing with this subject of bloodlines, you're dealing with the what they call the sangral. Uh, S-A-N-G-R-A-A-L, which means the Holy Blood. So this idea that, like, the Holy Grail is a cup is a falsity. 
it's it's really this bloodline, so Which is kinda like what they sort of allude to in, in the Da Vinci code. Yeah, but I mean again that's that's all Hollywoodized and, and everything else. But there yeah. are a lot of truths in that movie. So uh, one of which they, they wrote me from my grand lodge, which is Texas said, oh yeah, we're going to bring you up on Masonic charges, and the, you're, you've been revealing secrets and everything, and I sent him a copy of my St. Clair genealogy and said, well, uh, I can do whatever I want, and you can't say anything about it, because in your own books and laws and everything else, the St. Clairs are the, quote, hereditary protectors of craft masonry, so I can hemorrhage secrets out the mouth all day long, and really there's nothing that they can say about that by their own rules and they dropped all the charges interestingly when I said that hmm. so <laughs> the, the, does this, and what is the connection between uh, King Solomon uh, and uh, you know I mean the Solomon temple and, right. I mean, how, what, what, this because it seems like your symbols that like, go way back to ancient ancient times as, as being part of the grand architect well, there was a mason by the name of Cecil B. DeMille who was oh! mainly responsible for... I know that name! <laughs> ...who uh, kind of glamorized all of that and, and made everybody think of it in the, the terms that we do now. The fact is is that there's absolutely no empirical, archaeological, any kind of evidence to support the fact that King Solomon had this huge crazy palace, you know, solid gold and, and all that kind of stuff. Figures like uh, Hiram Abiff, who is the chief figure in the Masonic Blue Lodge ritual, that's who you take part as as a Master Mason. You're symbolically killed and resurrected like the story of Christ. There's no evidence that he existed, and so the Masons have kind of built up this this alternate version of history that they, they push to their own members, and there's absolutely nothing historically to support it. I mean, yeah, there was a King Solomon, but as far as the tabernacle in the wilderness and all that, I mean, you're probably talking more about, like, a simple altar and a simple tent, not some solid gold palace and, and all these things. So, it's... Does it, does it work with, I mean, and, and again, when you talk about the grand architect, does it work with uh, sacred geometry, or, or is, is, is oh, yeah, it, that's... yeah, it's all mathematical in some ways, and, and yet... And, and then and then ritual at the same time? And yeah, I mean, sacred geometry is a big thing to them. Things like uh, pi and the Fibonacci sequence and, and all of that, those are all uh, symbols that are taught in the Blue Lodge. Um, but, again, this, this notion that they're uh, playing with um, something more than what they've got, I think is just a bunch of, of myth that they've started. And as far as, I mean... Because Freemasonry, there was no such thing going back into like circa 1307 when the Templars were purged from France and everything. And, and Freemasonry was designed to kind of take that information of the Templars underground and protect it in lieu of what happened to them historically. And, uh, well, in, until a time arose in the future for it to be brought back out or whatever. But the problem is is I always make this analogy that like the babysitter ran off with the kids uh -huh. and that's basically what they did because they were supposed to uh, surrender it a long time ago and a matter of fact the Templars as an order have enjoyed now full pardon from Rome and, and all of that and yet they still keep this system going where it's all secret secret hush hush and, and all that and, and there's nothing in, historically in the context of the place to say that it should be, or that women shouldn't be allowed, or any of that, it's, that's what's come out of it. There's a couple of uh, comments in the chat right now that I just want to address. One is, um, uh, Joaquin says, I'm pretty sure the guest on A knows that Freemasons claim biblical origins dating back to the uh, Tubalcain. Tubalcain is mentioned in Genesis 4, 22, and was the son of Lamech, who is in the lineage of Cain. Yes, Tubal-Cain is, the, there's two passwords of a, the Master Mason degree. The first one is Tubal-Cain. The second one is Mahabone, which is Sanskrit for meaning holy child. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, they, the, um, Masons tend to believe, they don't really publicize this, but they, they believe that they are from the tribe of Cain as okay. far as this bloodline stuff, and that's when you would be tied back to now. Uh, Others, uh, scholars, would disagree with that and say that, no, it goes back to uh, Greek figures, Roman figures, and, and that kind of stuff. So, 
And now Kane would precede that, obviously, as far as time goes. But again, you've got really no evidence historically of, of these people existing. Unless, of course, there's some piece of evidence that has yet to be brought out that's sitting in the archives of the Vatican or, or wherever. So. Uh, there's also, oh, gosh, I almost like knocked on my machine. Uh, King Solomon, uh, there was a, one more question down here. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for it. Um, uh, darn it. I, 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 there's something I wanted to add. Well, basically, I mean, you get to be a 32nd degree, and they start telling you, because when you first come in the door, you get the, the line that they give to the public, which is, oh, Freemasonry started in 1717 in the Devil's Tavern in London. And that's not true. It, it goes back way before that. Once you're a 32nd, they start telling you, well, actually, this is the leftovers of the, the last one world religion that existed before the previous deluge. And it just... The problem is, is there's no scholar or anybody on earth who can trace the stuff back to a certain point and say, okay, here it is, we've got it, here it is on paper, or whatever, because you get back to the time of Christ and everything becomes so foggy and misty that there is no way to trace it. Uh, we have Tony Diaz with us uh, on the show as well. Uh, Tony, uh, you were um, in, in you know, you're chatting with me here on Skype. Um, you talked about your uncle um, being part of the Cuban Mafia in Miami. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yes. Uh, my my grand my uh, uncle uh, on my mother's side because uh, I have there, there's there's uh, actually hold on a second there's twelve there's actually twelve uh, you know brothers and sisters uh, six brothers and six sisters. Um, and uh, my one of my uncles, uh, he was 33rd degree Mason, and he was in charge of the Cuban Mafia back in the uh, between the 1960s all the way to the 2005. Okay. Now my my uncle was. Uh, hold on, I'm sorry. Hold on, I got it. <laughs> Not okay. barking at a Terminator, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I love it when animals jump in on shows. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there, there's a, there's been a, 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 another comment here. Um, uh, I wonder, I, I wonder when Freemasonry is mentioned. Nobody mentions the Hiscos tribe and how the prophets in the Bible. De, uh, de, exist uh you know what i'm having a, a difficulty reading that it's kind of uh... i'm not sure about the word hiscos but um i mean yeah there there are a lot of figures in the bible that yes were pharaohs that's uh just a little fact of of history and then you start dealing in like the dead sea scrolls the non Hammadi library and all that that stuff just becomes more and more evident so uh, when you mention like an old one world world religion, uh, it, it, now and we and they talk about the new world order and having a one world religion. Is is this the religion that you, that that they're probably going to? Um, well, yeah, that's what I think is so funny about that phrase, new world order. Is it's actually the old world order, so uh -huh. that they want desperately to be resurrected and brought back. So yeah, it's uh, it's a dangerous game they're playing. I mean, they they should ask themselves why the world went through the destruction it did <laughs> with that system in place. So, yeah, it's, they're playing a dangerous game. Uh, we, we talked like, the other night, and uh, and I, we are going to go to 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 break here in just a moment, so you know, we might not be able to get too much into this. But you, you mentioned wanting to start a different kind of uh, order. Yeah, you know? yeah, I'm, I'm working with some people... Um, some of the finest minds I think that I could have even come across. Uh, we're, we're starting this thing that we call the Magdalene Rite. And the idea is to, one, take Freemasonry and return it to a, like a previous, it's originally